Gary DePaul with Unlabeled Leadership. Welcome to episode 80, John Reardon on building leadership in Uganda. Here's a shout out to listeners in Alabama, specifically Huntsville, Seal, Calera, and in Arizona in Flagstaff and Phoenix. With that, let's get started. John Reardon has done some amazing things. He has more than 20 years experience helping organizations and professionals in the federal government, the private sector, and nonprofit organizations. He's conducted hundreds of planning, team building, and training workshops from large conferences to small teams. What's really amazing is his work in Uganda. In this episode, you're going to hear about some of his experiences. What he doesn't mention is he is the co-founder and director of the Cornerstone Leadership Academy. Now, this is a boarding school community for young adults that focuses on leadership, character, spiritual, and intellectual development. Like many of us, he was affected by the pandemic and has been transitioning to online learning. He has on his website, if you go there, about 20 courses that you could take around leadership development, and there's even one that's free. Oh, and one other thing about John. I'm teaching a leadership course at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, UNCC, and one of my graduate students interviewed him for the course. And that's just one example of the kindness and the stewardship that John has. Part one, five words. If you've listened to a few of these podcasts, you would probably know that I think of leadership as a way of helping other people develop mentally and morally. In other words, helping them build character. It's also about setting the right environment so people could perform at their best. In this story, John shares five words that describes this type of development. Here's John. As I look back, it's so much about the actions when I think of the influence and not so much words or statements in particular. You know, there's a whole long list of people who've influenced me through their actions. When it comes to particular words, this idea of something someone said, and what jumps right out at me, and I don't know them personally, and they didn't say this to me directly, but in a a book by Rob Goffey and Gareth Jones called Why Should Anyone Be Led By You? And the title is very thought-provoking in and of itself, right? What a great question these days. It sort of flips leadership on its head from you should do what I say because I'm the boss to, well, why should I do it? (laughs) Why should I be led by you? Yeah. And it's really provocative. But the tagline to that book and the article and all the just has absolutely like a two by four. I have been, had been in leadership development probably for five or six or so years. Just there's so many great tools out there and great strategies, but at the same time, really delving into the self-awareness and again, so many different models and, and ways to learn more about yourself. And so this sort of ongoing tension that I wasn't necessarily even aware of between all of this, the tagline for that book is be yourself with more skill, mm. be yourself with more skill. There's other, I don't know if they originated that. I mean, there's other authors or, or other you know, sources for quotes that are very similar, if not the same, et cetera. But those five words, be yourself with more skill. I'll tell you, if you know, I owe them or whoever originated that quote, <laughs> five words that just was like a laser beam to bring into focus everything I've been thinking about, grappling with, sharing, you know, in my practice around leadership and working with others and coaching and just bringing that into focus that this is what it boils down to is these two sides, two inextricable sides of the same equation, same coin, whatever you want to call it. This be yourself, two words, be yourself, an incredible lifelong journey of challenge, of exploration, of discovery and implementation to be yourself, figure out who you are, put that into practice, right? Be your best self and your strengths and your weaknesses and warts and all. But it doesn't stop there. And what's so powerful is with those three extra words, because <laughs> be yourself is a is a, a phenomenal journey in and of itself. But in terms of leadership, it's what I love is this transition of the three more words with more skill. 
I spent many years trying to be better, trying to be some, essentially trying to be somebody else, you know, trying to, trying to make myself different, trying to improve here, trying to be more of this and less of that. And really look in retrospect, realizing, oh, I was trying to be someone else. I was trying to be more like someone and less of this. And as opposed to being myself and adding skill adding tools to my toolkit, adding capacity, becoming more skillful in using what I have and what I've been given and and who I am. And gosh, I can't tell you how that just brought it into focus. And that has been my mantra ever since. I, If I had a nickel for every time I've said that phrase and, and coached folks around this and, and prefaced almost every conversation I have around leadership and development with this statement to look, I I don't want anyone to try to be something different. At the same time, it's not just about who you are, period. It is about gaining skill and capacity and ability. And so that has had a huge impact on me just individually to become, I like the phrase, comfortable in my own skin, owning myself, embracing my gifts and my strengths and my weaknesses and addressing them, but not beating myself up for them, searching and and really owning and discovering my core values, what really drives me and all those aspects of who I am and trying to be on the journey to become more skillful with that, to use my abilities more skillfully, to use my gifts and my personality more skillfully, to know when to go full throttle versus when to back off and ease up and maybe even put it in reverse. (laughs) There's definitely a linkage between leadership and learning. And it's Mm -hmm. really interesting. I haven't thought about this part before you talked about that phrase about be yourself. Part of that is you see someone who models a particular type of behavior and you want to emulate that. You need to internalize it and make whatever it is you're trying to do your own. Yeah. And and as I said, I had some amazing mentors, fantastic people who poured into me and, and invested in me. I'd say in retrospect, the distinction is trying to make someone better by telling them you should do it this way, or perhaps not necessarily verbatim, but essentially communicating you should be like me Yeah. versus you need to be the best version of you. And that may or may not end up looking like me. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that to me is this inherent piece about be yourself with more skills. I am unapologetic about challenging people, leaders, and people who want to lead, who, who are leading, to expand their capacity to become more skillful in who they are and what they bring and what they know and what they're learning. But it's grounded in be true to yourself, be um, authentic in using your strengths and your gifts and your abilities and living up your, to your core values. And so it's this interesting dichotomy of it doesn't, I'm never telling you to be someone else or be different than who you are, but to be more skillful with who you are. And it's a really profound distinction. And it's had such meaning to me to just, like I said, on my own life journey and my own leadership and my work and my family and in my community and relationship. Part two, wolf cubs, wolves, and senior wolves. The late Roger Kaufman talked about how our actions are either contributing towards society or taking from it. Even if your role is technical training, it still applies. What John has done in Uganda falls in the big category of contributing to society and really making an influence for thousands of people. And like so many people do on this podcast, he puts the spotlight on someone else not himself, which really illustrates his leadership. Here's John. I had the opportunity to be in East Africa in the 90s, Uganda, went in 1990 to work alongside a young man named Mike Timmis, who was getting some things started there. As we explored different possibilities of what to invest in and what to establish, we wanted to make an investment in that nation. The people in Uganda was coming out of a very tumultuous history. And in 1990, things were beginning to settle down, especially in the southern half of the country. And we were in Kampala, and we would go in out to the market, and there were all these market boys that would run around the market. They'd come up, they'd offer to carry your bag, they'd run and find things for you. You'd give them a few Uganda shillings, you know, obviously very energetic, very motivated. These are really impressive um, young men just living on the streets, but they would make a living by doing this service with the market boys. We thought, well, these are great guys we ought to invest in. I mean, they're energetic, they're willing, they're interested. So we said to them, well, what are you interested in? And they said, oh, 
uh, football, soccer, football. They're just we love football. Okay, we said, well, what if we um, we'll bring a soccer ball and come to the to the pitch to the field and we'll play soccer. And we thought, you know, a great way to sort of get them together, talk, encourage them, see if we can just sort of invest in them a little bit. Day one, so okay, we'll meet tomorrow. Well, like sixty boys showed up. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> we're, we're thinking maybe five or six. Like, um, so word spread very quickly <laughs> that wow. these. Uh, two Mazungus, which is a Swahili word for white person. Uh, these two Americans were going to be at the soccer field tomorrow. And so about 60 boys showed up from, I mean, from five years old to, you know, 18. Needless to say, that was a little overwhelming. I had played a little soccer in high school. <laughs> I no, barely knew how to kick a ball. And that was fine. They, they were off and running and they were having a great time. But but how to really make something of this. So we continued along with these boys showing up and kind of creating a bit of a club and well, for probably a few uh, months and a few weeks, a few months. And then we got word that this soccer player, a Ugandan man, was showing up when they were playing when we weren't there, that he was helping them and teaching them a lot. And we were a little suspicious because you get people who kind of want to sort of get there in and figure out how they can, you know, sort of take something over or make some money on something. And so we were very kind of skeptical. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, it, Coach Coach Stone has been helping us a lot. He's really helping us. And he's a great guy. And then we, he should come on. He should be part of the team. And he should help the team. And, well, you know, we're very suspicious. Well, long story short, a few months go by. He's just doing this on his own time. So we get to meet this Coach Stone. And I'm still quite skeptical. He says, I'm happy to coach the boys. This is what I want to do. I used to play professional soccer here in Uganda, but I was injured. And I'm now I will just do this for after work. When I'm done with my work, I will come and coach the boys. Okay, fine. Well, we're not going to pay you anything. Just so you know, no, not interested in money. I'm just going to, well, okay, we'll see. Thinking, eh, he'll do it for a few weeks. And then when we don't pay him, he'll disappear. 35 years later, Coach Nibasa Stone Chambade is still coaching <laughs> hundreds of boys. Wow. Hundreds. And I mean hundreds at any given moment, thousands over the course of the past 35 years. And his, the, it's called the Wolves Soccer Team Program. And, and just by having a, a soccer balls on a pitch, these boys show up from all over the city and he coaches them. But his purpose is that he is investing in them. And he sees each of these boys as a man. And whether they're five years old, they're called the wolf cubs. The young men are called the wolves. And then there's the senior wolves and the, all the way up to the 18 to 21 year old men who have like a semi-professional team. And he is just investing in them. And it's at the practice times through the game and through the, the sport and the teamwork, but then off the pitch and the time that he spends, he lives in the same neighborhood as many of them do. And he has poured his life into thousands of young men uh, in the city and in, in the country. If you walk with stone through Kampala, it does not matter where you go. You will hear people shouting, Coach, Coach Stone, hey Stone, hey Coach Stone. <laughs> These men. That is incredible. 50 year men, old men with families and businesses to, to five year olds who are just getting involved in the program now. And it has just been such an unbelievable example of someone who just dedicated his life just to investing and building leaders. And oh, by the way, he's on the National Council for the Uganda National Team, and he's the, the chairman of the coaches association there has been, you know, he's very involved in the broader level. He's just the humblest guy just walking the streets and just pouring his life into these men, these young men and men. And it's just been an amazing example in a country that has had such an unbelievably tumultuous history and incredible divisiveness. And that continues today on different levels. And yet he invests in everyone who shows up, no matter what tribe, no matter what race, no matter what background, no matter what religion, he just embraces them and invests in them. Just an unbelievable example. He's not only just building leadership principles and, and ideas, he's strengthening the community yeah. and camaraderie with those who just live there and experience that life. Yeah. And it's all of the lessons that we talk about in sports, but there they're like, they're almost life and death. I mean, almost in terms of, you know, we talk about teamwork. Well, there you're talking about people playing on a team with someone from a different tribe whose ancestry for the history of the country, they've been at odds if, and or at war with one another, the Westerners and the Easterners and the Northerners, and the, they have deep, deep seated animosity in their history. Now he's saying, okay, you're going to play next to him and you're going to be teammates. And they look at each other like, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> like, I wouldn't ever talk to this person 
on the street. We would go after each other and try to beat each other. Nope, you're now teammates. A, a player who's a Muslim uh, playing next to a player who's a Pentecostal Christian. On the streets of Uganda, you, they wouldn't talk to one another. They would be essentially be enemy. He's, you're now teammates. You're now brothers. You now are going to play next to each other. You're going to, you know, and so in our context, teamwork in America, it's like, oh, that's a great idea. In Uganda, that is a profound life lesson. It's brilliant. Wouldn't it be cool? I mean, this would be neat in so many instances. If you could see a map and if you could see the highlights of all the people that he's influenced over the years and where they are now and just see that and it'd just be amazing. Leave alone the secondary lives of their families, their wives, their children, people who have been abandoned, these young men who've been left on the streets and then now they're capable and loving fathers who are raising bright and educated children. And like, it's just very visceral and very real. And it's awesome. It's a beautiful way of showing how doing these simple act of coaching can lead to influencing a whole society, almost at a bottom up way of doing it. Just imagine what Uganda would be like without people like him. It is one of those headlines are great and they can be inspiring and they can be eye-catching but he's the salt in the world he, you don't see it he's not going to make headlines it's not some high flying program that gets national attention but it's this constant quiet influence that is changing lives and those lives are being then dispersed into the entire country in every sector whether it's businesses whether it's nonprofits whether it's government and they're going from living on the streets to having hope to having ideas into having potential and bringing that to into their lives. I mean, obviously not every boy can come to terms with the trauma that they face, but just the number of lives are impacted. And through him, he's raised up leaders who help him, who care for the boys, who look after, you know, and help them um, meet some of the basic fundamental life needs. And But it's just this quiet, ongoing commitment, and there's no big fanfare, and there's no giant building with big signs and big fundraisers. It's just Coach Stone and his team and his, his group of coaches that work with these young men. Part three, building your agenda, purpose, and destination. John shares some advice around those same five words that we started the episode with, but this time he takes it to the next level, to a higher level, around your purpose and destination. Here's John to explain. I find a lot of what I do is pass along wisdom that I've had the blessing to come across. This mantra, this challenge to be yourself with more skill, I really would be remiss to start with anything else. It, to me, it summarizes and encapsulates so many great thoughts and challenges around leadership, around life. My personal sort of phrase is expanding your capacity, but this statement to be yourself with more skill is what that's about is in order to do that. But this be yourself grounds you in not getting caught up in somebody else's agenda, not getting caught up in what I think I ought to be and what I ought to do and who I ought to become, but who are you? And that journey of discovery. What do you want to do with your career? But more importantly, what do you want to do with your life? And more importantly, who do you want to be? Who were you born to be? What, what are your strengths and your, and your weaknesses, uh, your gifts and talents and passions? There's all these different terms that have different subtleties and different meanings. Um, what is your life's purpose? And that journey of discovery applies to everything to the impact you want to have on the world, your life, but it also has everything to do with who you want to be as a spouse, as a partner, as a, a parent, as a son, a daughter, a sibling, you know, it just goes on and it impacts every aspect of life in terms of who am I, who do I want to be, and how do I move towards that? And then this phrase, the second half of that, the with more skill, you know, embracing who I am, but not necessarily being self-satisfied. There's a difference between I embrace who I am and I'm comfortable in my own skin and I'm okay with it and I've come to terms with my strengths and my weaknesses, but that doesn't mean I leave it there. I want to then add skill and awareness to that. I liken it to, uh, and the strengths conversation is one of my favorites. You know, what are your strengths? And your strengths are like a chainsaw. They are incredibly powerful. And if you use them well, you can do amazing things, you know, not just taking down dead limbs and pruning a tree, but, you know, these carvers who do these amazing creations with chainsaws, right? And they create these amazing, beautiful car. And it's just amazing to watch someone who's that skilled, right, with a, something as powerful as a chainsaw. 
Well, the flip side of the metaphor is right in the wrong hands. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> watch out. <laughs> right? Goes from being an incredibly powerful, creative, you know, kept with tons of, to very dangerous <laughs> and potentially deadly. <laughs> I like that metaphor very, very much. It's I'm a strong extrovert. I can connect with folks. I love, I get energized by being with people. Um, nobody's a stranger. I'm comfortable with anyone. That's great. But if I sit down next to someone on the airplane and I just unload on them, <laughs> invade their space for the next eight hours, that poor person's going <laughs> to <gonna> parachute <laughs> and jump out being skillful enough to recognize, oh, okay, they're reading a book. They would like some personal space. You know, maybe I shouldn't talk to them the whole time. And just becoming skillful with who I am and what I bring to the world and to others. But uh, there's tremendous reward in that. For me, the phrase of, it, of expanding my capacity and helping others expand their capacity to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve, to be who you want to be, to, to have the impact on the world that you want to have by being yourself with more skill. I look at that phrase. I think it is definitely at the meta level that you're thinking. You're not thinking about the immediate event that you're currently in and thinking about what do I have to do to build myself to be better at, at what I'm doing. It's more at a, a higher level. And you mentioned the word purpose. It's finding out what you're trying to do, not necessarily the details of the daily stuff, but then how do you develop yourself so you can strengthen that purpose and validate that purpose. There's learning and how to apply what you're trying to be throughout your life. You know, we get caught up in, in our career, in, in the work and family. And the next thing you know, the years are passing in this point of saying, whoa, whoa, hold on for a second. What is the destination that I want to um, reach? Whether it's a specific goal or something measurable or just something more visionary in terms of my life, my legacy, my uh, when I'm 80 years old, or, you know, like however I, you want to frame that. So that now back up and ask myself, okay, what daily choices am I making that are either taking me in that direction? or not? And then how can I make more choices that take me in the right direction, as opposed to ones that are taking me in no direction, or leave alone in the wrong direction. And so yeah, that process of choice rather than chance comes down to both the esoteric, you know, life questions, and then they back map down to, you know, what am I doing with my day today? And is my day purposeful? And is it taking me in the right direction? And, and there's plenty of times when I'm filling out receipts and paperwork, but in the overall, is my life moving in the direction towards the vision that I have for it? And having that reflection is so crucial for doing this type of work. Absolutely. There's a, an exercise that I picked up somewhere along the way, just the, the life journey. And it's just a great um, reflection activity to do and, and with a team and, or colleagues or family members or whatever, and just put a big piece of paper on the wall and map out your life from your birthday to today and the major milestones and the ups and the downs. And that can unpack you know, that as deeply as you want. But then you go backwards into the history behind your birth and your life and your parents, family and history and all the different sort of cultural influences, etc. And then, of course, an exciting piece is the journey forward. Okay, so from today forward, and then what's your where do you see your life going? What's the long term vision? If God willing, you live to be 100, what do you want to say about yourself at that point? What kind of do you, is it family? Is it career? Is it impact? What is it? And just that challenge of like really thinking that through and speaking to it, putting it in on paper and, and articulating it and kind of getting it out of the back of our minds. Most of us have these thoughts rattling around, but it's rare to take actual time to crystallize them and get them out. And then from that, you can map, okay, so how do I get from today to there? And what I see is if you do that and you make that part of your habit and periodically reflect, even doing this one particular mapping exercise, but then continue to do this, then amazing things can happen. Doors that you did not know were there begin to open up for you. Right. And, you know, life brings along serendipitous opportunities. I don't think you can map your life out and then that's it. You, you set the course and nothing will change or, or no challenges will come. But as they say, having a destination means that you can re-vector and you can encounter both the challenges and then face those and decide how to handle those in a way that brings you back on course or opportunities that come along and recognize that this is an opportunity that is in alignment with where I want to be in the long run and help to make those distinctions. Otherwise, like you said, it's just a matter of chance and it's just, you know, I'm just living like life as a crapshoot. My thanks to John Reardon. 
If you'd like to learn more about John, go to the show notes. And if you have a question or comment, go to unlabelleadership.com, click the message icon, and you can leave a voicemail message up to one minute. I'd like to thank those who contribute to the show. Your contribution makes a difference, mainly because this is a volunteer service. Lastly, I'd like to thank you for listening. Until next time, lead on.